Detroit and Montreal, the Grand Prix scene moves back to Europe to the fast, flat and curvy 2.6 mile circuit amongst the sand dunes of Zandvoort by the sea for round nine of the 16 round world championship. Over halfway through the series then, and Zandvoort's a place where the powerful turbo cars can really use their horsepower. So it's no surprise that six of the fastest qualifiers in practice are turbos. Arnoux's Renault in pole position yet again, five seconds faster than his own 1980 lap record, with a scorching lap at 130 miles an hour. With Prost second fastest, Piquet third in his Brabham BMW, Pironi's Ferrari fourth, Tombe having his first drive for Ferrari sixth, and fifth place man, Nicky Lauda's McLaren, the only three litre car in the top six on the grid. With eight races still to go, John Watson leads the world championship by a comfortable 10 points, but only nine points separate the next six. Pironi with 20, Patrese 19, Prost 18, Rosberg 17, Lauda 12, and world champion Nelson Piquet with 11. But as ever, the question is, will the turbos last? Ende. Heute geht es also im Grand Prix Sport weiter nach der dreiwöchigen Pause seit den Übersee Grand Prix Rennen in Detroit und in Kanada. Heute also wieder ein Lauf in Europa, großer Preis von Holland, ein klassisches Ereignis. Allerdings dieser große Preis von Holland ist sehr, sehr lange fraglich gewesen. Ursprünglich war er nämlich nicht auf der Liste der 16 Grand Prix Rennen für 1982. Aber durch die Absage des Rennens in Argentinien und durch den Boykott des Rennens von Imola hat die FOCA, also die Formel 1 Konstrukteursvereinigung, ein bisschen Geld verloren. Sie hat auf diesen Grund versucht einen Grand Prix wieder ins Programm zurückzubringen. Man hat voriges Wochenende ursprünglich in Charama fahren wollen, anlässlich der Fußball-Weltmeisterschaft. Dieser Plan ist aber misslungen und darum gibt es heute den neunten Lauf zur diesjährigen Weltmeisterschaft auf der Dünenrennstrecke von Zandvoort, ungefähr 25 bis 30 Kilometer von Amsterdam entfernt am äh, holländischen Nordseestrand. Sie können anhand dieser Bilder, die noch aus dem Training äh, sind, erkennen, wie es hier ungefähr ausschaut. Die Strecke von Sandford liegt interessanterweise unterhalb des Meeresspiegels und zwar in den Dünen eingebettet. Hier haben Sie ein paar Eindrücke aus dem Training. Das sind zum Beispiel die Zeitnahmemaschinen. Äh, es ist ja nicht nur längst so, dass sämtliche Teams schon ihre eigene Boxenzeitnahme haben, um jederzeit in jeder Trainingsphase zu wissen, wie schnell die eigenen Autos sind und wie schnell die Autos der Konkurrenz sondern man macht natürlich auch speziell auf einer so langen Start Zielgeraden wie hier in Zandvoort die Höchstgeschwindigkeitsmessungen und da haben alle Teams ihre Messungen durchgeführt. Schnellst auf der Geraden war übrigens nicht dieser Matra 12 Zylinder von Jacques Lafitte, sondern war der Ferrari von Patrick Tambay mit 321 Kilometern pro Stunde. 321, also die absolute Höchstgeschwindigkeit, die hier gemessen wurde. Hier hatten Sie ganz kurz im Bild Amano Kuogi, den langjährigen Mechaniker von Niki Lauda, der jetzt natürlich bei Alfa Romeo arbeitet. Das sind die Arbeiten im Team von Ligier Talbot. Hier hat sich überraschenderweise Eddie Chiva, der zweite vom Grand Prix in Detroit, nicht qualifizieren können. Einziger Fahrer dieses Teams, also heute der Franzose Jacques Lafitte. Vielleicht erinnern Sie sich, Lafitte hatte hier voriges Jahr eine Kollision mit Carlos Reutemann beim Anbremsen der berühmten Kurve von Sanford, der Tarzan-Kurve. Es war eine Kollision, die im Rückspiegel betrachtet beiden Fahrern damals möglicherweise den Weltmeistertitel gekostet hat. Das ist der Holländer Jan Lammers, rechtzeitig fit geworden wieder für seinen Heimat Grand Prix. Lammers hatte sich ja in Detroit beim Training den rechten Daumen gebrochen. Und das ist Bruno Giacomelli und das ist der Wagen seines Teamkollegen Andrea De Cesaris. Giacomelli hat heuer noch keine Punkte in der Weltmeisterschaft und jetzt sind wir nach diesen Trainingsbildern sozusagen live dabei. Ungefähr elf Minuten noch bis zum Start des Grand Prix von Holland. Sie sehen die Nordsee ein bisschen aufgewühlt. Das Wetter hat sich hier in den letzten Tagen mehrmals verändert. Am Freitag Regen nach 40 Minuten des Trainings. Gestern unerwartet heiß und aus diesem Grund, weil die Strecke um ungefähr eineinhalb bis zwei Sekunden langsamer war, waren auch die Trainingszeiten deutlich schlechter als am Tag davor. Die Startaufstellung war eigentlich schon aufgrund des Donnerstagtrainings gegeben. Naja, und dann hat es heute Nacht noch einen neuerlichen Wettersturz gegeben. Es wurde empfindlich kalt und einige Fahrer, unter anderem auch der Sieger des Canada Grand Prix, Nelson Piquet, haben zugegeben, dass sie sehr, sehr schlecht geschlafen hätten vor diesem heutigen Rennen. Sie sehen auch, es gibt keine Urlaub- oder Feriengäste am Strand, obwohl es das erste große Ferienwochenende hier in Zandvoort ist. Üblicherweise hier Zehntausende von deutschen Feriengästen in den holländischen Dünen im Nordsee-Badeort Zandvoort. 
Die Strecke hier wurde von Jan Hugenholz gebaut, einem Holländer. Es ist also eine äh, künstlich angelegte Rennstrecke in den Dünen eingebettet. Zeichnet sich durch sehr schnelle und schwierig zu fahrende Kurvenkombinationen aus. Hier haben Sie die lange Startzielgerade von Zandvoort. Und die erste Kurve ist die berühmte Tarzan-Kurve. Hier finden jedes Jahr die spektakulären Ausbremsversuche oder Ausbremsmanöver statt. Das ist der trainingsschnellste Wagen und zwar der Renault Turbo des kleinen Franzosen René Arnoux. Arnoux ist aber nennt sozusagen auf die Trainingsbestzeit in Zandvoort. In den letzten vier Jahren war er dreimal bei diesem Rennen der Trainingsschnellste. Sie sehen rechts oben eingeblendet René Arnoux während der Fahrt zu seiner Trainingsbestzeit. 1,14,233 ist die Marke und der Schnitt 206 km pro Stunde. Die Renault Turbos dominieren also nicht nur auf höher gelegenen Strecken, wie zum Beispiel in Kialami in Südafrika, sondern sie haben auch schon seit einigen Jahren in Zandvoort bewiesen, dass sie auch auf niedrig gelegenen Rennstrecken auf äh, Meereshöhe oder sogar ein bisschen darunter, zwei Meter glaube ich, unter dem Meeresspiegel zu den schnellsten gehören. Alain Prost, der in der Weltmeisterschaft ja so lange geführt hat, hat aus dem Renault-Sieg im Training einen Trainingsdoppelsieg gemacht, 1,14,66. Alain Prost ist der Vorjahrsieger von Zandvoort und auch der Mann, der voriges Jahr hier Trainingsschnellster war, seine Marke aus dem Vorjahr wurde im Training heuer von nicht weniger als 17 Fahrern unterboten. Für Prost und Arnoux gilt in etwa das Gleiche. Die beiden Renault-Fahrer brauchen dringend Punkte. Es ist schon sehr lange her, dass sie zuletzt Punkte in der Weltmeisterschaft gemacht haben. Genauer gesagt seit dem äh, großen Preis von Brasilien in Rio de Janeiro. Und der wurde ja, Sie erinnern sich vielleicht, bereits im März gefahren. Darf ich Ihnen sagen, wodurch Sie die beiden Renault-Fahrzeuge unterscheiden können? Alain Prost hat eine rote Wagenspitze und René Arnoux hat eine blaue. Von Renault erwartet man heute sehr viel, vor allem weil es ja die erste richtige Turbostrecke ist. Sie wissen im Sommer immer die Serie der schnellen Rennstrecken. Das ist hier in Sandford, das ist der Österreicher in Hockenheim und dazwischen natürlich der englische Grand Prix. Brands Hedge, Silverstone, in diesem Jahr gefahren in Brands Hedge. Nelson Piquet ist der Sieger des Grand Prix von Kanada vor drei Wochen. Es war der erste Sieg für den Brepen BMW Turbo und eine wirklich großartige Leistung von Nelson Piquet. Allerdings wird ein bisschen Herzklopfen herausgefahren, denn Nelson Piquet hatte am Ende des Rennens, das hat man genau gemessen, nur noch drei Liter Benzin in den Tanks. Das heißt, hätte der Kanada Grand Prix eine Runde länger gedauert, Piquet hätte dieses Rennen nicht nur nicht gewonnen, sondern mit höchster Wahrscheinlichkeit auch nicht beendet. Piquet hatte im Donnerstag-Training einen Motorschaden, musste dann in den Ersatzwagen umsteigen, hatte einen äh, ziemlich bösen Dreher in der Tarzan-Kurve aus einem ziemlich dummen Grund. Sie wissen vielleicht, die Fahrzeuge haben im Cockpit Räder, mit denen die Fahrer einiges verstellen können, den Stabilisator oder die Bremsbalance, Vorderbremsen, Hinterbremsen und was die Turbopiloten betrifft, natürlich auch den Ladedruck. Auf alle Fälle wollte Piquet den Ladedruck gerade von 1,8 auf 2 Bar erhöhen, hat sich aber vergriffen, hat das falsche Rad genommen, hat alle Bremskraft nach hinten gedreht auf die Hinterräder und die Folge war, dass die Hinterräder beim Anbremsen der Tarzan blockiert haben. Didier Pironi liegt in der Weltmeisterschaft momentan an zweiter Stelle, zehn Punkte hinter John Watson, das heißt Pironi kann auch bei einem Sieg heute die Führung in der Weltmeisterschaft nicht übernehmen. Watson bleibt auf alle Fälle in Führung bis zum großen Preis von England in Brands Hedge, zumindest. Didier Pironi fuhr heute beim Aufwärmtraining wie immer bei Ferrari mit vollen Tanks und er fuhr heute recht schnell. Es war insgesamt die drittbeste Zeit und schnellster war heute Mittag, das sage ich Ihnen auch noch schnell. Nelson Piquet, zweiter, ganz sensationell, Derek Warwick mit dem Pullman Hard Turbo und dann äh, dritter Stelle dann Didier Pironi mit vollen Tanks und das heißt bei Ferrari wie bei Renault ungefähr 220 Liter. Niki Lauda hat den äh, Startplatz von Pironi, den viertbesten, nur um 8000 Sekunden verpasst. Und zwar in jener Runde, in der der Chilene Eliseo Salazar blockiert hat. Salazar hat Niki Lauda aufgehalten beim Anbremsen der Tarzan-Kurve und hat ihn dann erst in der Kurve vorbeigewunken. Da hatte Lauda aber bereits die entscheidenden Zehntelsekunden verloren. Trotzdem, Niki Lauda, der zweifache Sieg im Holland Grand Prix 1974 und 77, war im Training der schnellste Nicht-Turbofahrer, also der schnellste Fahrer mit einem Ford Cosworth. Acht Zylinder Saugmotor. Eine sehr gute Leistung, allerdings heute schon ein bisschen ein Schreck für Niki Lauda im vormittägigen Aufwärmtraining. Ein Motorschaden am McLaren Ford, das heißt der Motor hatte zu viel Öl verbraucht und die McLaren Techniker haben sich dann blitzschnell entschlossen den Motor zu wechseln und sie haben es in Rekordzeit geschafft. Denn bereits eine Stunde nach dem Ausbau hat der neue Motor äh, bereits gezündet, konnte der neue Motor also gestartet werden. 
Vicky Lauder wird auf der linken Seite harte Reifen montiert haben, auf der rechten weich. Ich erzähle Ihnen das alles später. Das ist ein Heimkehrer im Grand Prix Sport, der Franzose Patrick Tambay. Er tritt bei Ferrari ein schweres Erbe an. Er fährt den Ferrari Nummer 27 von Gilles Villeneuve. Seit dem Unfall von Villeneuve in Zolda ist Ferrari ja ausschließlich mit Didier Pironi gefahren. Pironi war es, der Patrick Tambay empfohlen hat und äh, Ferrari hat ihn genommen. Tambay hatte sich aus seinem amerikanischen can vertrag auskaufen müssen. Patrick Tambay, der ehemalige französische Abfahrt-Juniorenmeister im Skirennsport, der in der Formel 1 für Ensign, für McLaren, für Theodore und so weiter gefahren ist, nie richtig Fuß fassen konnte, interessanterweise bereits vor sechs Jahren ein Ferrari-Angebot gehabt hat, dieses Angebot aber nicht genützt hat. Auch darüber vielleicht später ein bisschen mehr. Das ist der Fine Keke Rosberg auf Williams. Er ist der zweitschnellste Fortfahrer. Keke Rosberg, der heuer schon so oft in einem Grand Prix geführt hat und noch immer keinen gewonnen hat. Rosberg wurde gestern im Abschlusstraining seine beste Trainingszeit annulliert, genauso wie bei Nelson Piquet. Der Grund war, dass beide Fahrer Piquet und Rosberg Reifen verwendet hatten, die nicht markiert waren, was laut dem neuen Reglement verboten ist. Der Grund war, als Williams gesehen hat, dass die Strecke um eineinhalb bis zwei Sekunden schlechter oder langsamer ist als am Tag zuvor, dass die Zeiten also schlechter werden, hat er gesagt, es ist viel gescheiter. Rosberg fährt bereits seine Reifen fürs Rennen ein und äh, wir können uns in der Startaufstellung ohnehin nicht mehr verbessern. Bruno Giacomelli mit dem schnelleren der beiden Alfa Romeo 12 Zylinder Giacomelli heuer noch ohne Punkte in der Weltmeisterschaft, die im Gegensatz zu Andrea De Cesaris sehr viele Kollisionen, sehr viele Karambolagen und Unfälle in diesem Jahr sind jetzt langsam Zeit, wieder die Zielflagge eines Grand Prix zu sehen. Dass die Alpha-Fahrer und die Alpha-Wage überhaupt hier sind, ist ein kleines Wunder. Vorige Woche gab es schwere Unwetter in Italien, es gab einen Sturm und die Alfa Romeo Fabrik ist sehr stark beschädigt worden. Zwei Wände sind eingestürzt. Das Dach ist eingestürzt, zwei Alpha Formel 1 Rennwagen wurden irreparabel beschädigt. Glücklicherweise aber ein Auto aus dem Vorjahr und ein Ersatzwagen von heuer. René Arnoux mit 1,14,23, also Trainingsbester. Alain Prost 1,14,66, 14 Sekunden dahinter. Dritter Nelson Piquet mit dem Brepham BMW Turbo. Vierter Didier Pironi Ferrari, also vier Turbofahrzeuge geschlossen auf den ersten vier Startplätzen. Dann kommt Niki Lauda mit dem Eclan, der schnellste Fahrer mit einem Saugmotor, gefolgt von Patrick Tambay, wieder einem Turbo und dann Keke Rosberg mit dem neuen Williams FW für Frank Williams 08. Die beiden Alpha-Fahrer Bruno Giacomelli, diesmal vor Andrea De Cesaris, der sich auf Stadtkursen üblicherweise wesentlich wohler fühlt als auf Rennstrecken wie in Sandford. Riccardo Patrese fährt wieder den Brepem BMW Turbo zum ersten Mal seit Kialami, nachdem er ja in Monte Carlo mit dem Brepem Ford gewonnen hat. John Watson mit dem Eklam langsam als Niki Lauda, das Trainingsduell Österreich-Nordirland 3 zu 2 für Lauda gegen Watson. Daly auf Williams, dann die Überraschung im Training, Derek Warwick mit dem Tolman Hart Turbo, der zweitschnellste vom heutigen Aufwärmtraining. Michele Alberetto, Tirel in den letzten Rennen ein bisschen zurückgefallen, viermal hintereinander nicht im Ziel gewesen. Der Angelis auf Lotus war hier in der Testwoche am schnellsten und auch im Freitag Frühtraining der schnellste. Die beiden Aerosfahrer Baldi diesmal vor Marc Surer, der Grund war, dass Baldi einmal unabsichtlich im Training seinen Schweizer Teamkollegen blockiert hat. Winkel Hock mit dem ATS im guten Mittelfeld. Serra auf Fittibaldi mit dem alten Fittibaldi. Der neue Wagen kommt in Brent Hedge. Der zweite Tierrail-Fahrer Brian Henson. Jacques Lafitte, der Niki Lauda hier vor fünf Jahren ein großartiges Duell geliefert hat. In der Startaufstellung sehr weit zurückgerutscht. Dann äh, Bösel mit dem Arch, schneller als sein Teamkollege Jochen Maas. Und dazwischen äh, Jean-Pierre Charrier mit dem Ocella. Das ist jenes Team, das durch die Fahrertragödie von Kanada durch diesen tödlichen Unfall Riccardo Paletti sehr schwer getroffen wurde. Salazar mit dem ATS und an der letzten Stelle Jan Lammers mit dem Theodore nach dem äh, gebrochenen Daumen von Detroit. Lammers hat Fleißaufgaben an diesem Wochenende gemacht. Er flog gestern unmittelbar nach dem Training nach England, nach Donington, um sich für ein Renault 5 Cup Rennen zu qualifizieren. Flog dann mit einer speziellen äh, Hubschrauber, Flugzeug, Hubschrauber, Autostaffette nach Zandvoort, um hier den Grand Prix zu fahren. Und äh, fliegt heute gleich nach dem Rennen wieder zurück nach Holland, äh, Entschuldigung, von Holland nach England, um morgen in Donington das R5-Rennen zu fahren. Schauen wir uns jetzt den Kurs von Zandvoort an. 4,2 Kilometer ist der Langbremspunkt für die Tarzan-Kurve, in der sich, wie gesagt, Nelson Piquet gedreht hat vorgestern. Knapp 100 Meter. 
nach der Tarzan-Kurve die Gerlach-Kurve und dann die Hugenholz-Kurve. Hugenholz-Kurve ist die langsame Kurve, eine Spitzkehre, die im zweiten Gang gefahren wird, hinter den Boxen. Und dann geht es hinauf Richtung Hunteruck, Richtung Rob Lotemarker. Kurve. Rob Slotemacher ist der Besitzer der Schleuderschule von Sanford gewesen. In dieser Schule hat er echten Schleuderunterricht gegeben. Jan Lammers war einer seiner gelehrigsten Schüler. Jan Lammers ist hier bereits als Zwölfjähriger in Rennfahrzeugen gesessen. Das ist die Rob Slotemacher Kurve. Dann Skyflag, die sehr schnelle Rechtskurve. Dann gibt es eine der beiden Schikanen, dann den Osttunnel. Diese Kurve wird im vierten Gang vollgenommen. Leichte Rechtskrümmung. Dann die Panoramakurve, eigentlich wieder eine Schikane, die im zweiten Gang genommen wird. Unmittelbar danach wieder Beschleunigung. Dritten Gang. Jetzt im Bild gesehen die Blinklichter auf der Strecke. Skizze eingeblendet. Panoramakurve, eine Rechts-Links-Schikane. Und der Boss Uiz, das ist die Zielkurve. Hier kommt es besonders darauf an, im vierten Gang die optimale Linie zu erreichen und wirklich mit idealer Drehzahl aus dieser Kurve herauszukommen. Denn äh, wenn man äh, nur ein paar hundert Umdrehungen verliert in dieser Zielkurve, dann fällt einem die Geschwindigkeit natürlich auf der Geraden. Auf der Geraden, auf der die Autos, wie gesagt, Spitzengeschwindigkeiten von 321 km pro Stunde erreichen. So schnell fuhr Patrick També. Patrese wurde mit 317 gestoppt, Prost mit 309, De Cesaris 296, Piquet 295, Lafitte 294 und Niki Lauda mit 293 km pro Stunde. Niki Lauda will also, um ganz sicher zu gehen, And I remind you, in pole position, René Arnoux, the Frenchman, who has uh, only scored uh, four points in the World Championship so far. He's way down in 15th place. Behind him is Nelson Piquet. To the right of your picture, second on the grid is Alain Prost. Fourth behind Alain Prost is uh, Didier Pironi. Behind Nelson Piquet is uh, Nicky Lauda. And behind... The then is Patrick Tombe. Now there's a drag down to Tarzan, which is a second gear corner, which they take at about 90 miles an hour. Watch for the green. The Dutch Grand Prix is on. Let's now we're going to get a clean start. All is well so far. It is our new leading. It is Pironi coming up well. It's Prost going through. There's Patrick Tombe coming up into about fourth position. And it's the two Renaults away, and it looks like Ali Tiz is Alain Prost in the lead. Arnoux second, Pironi third, Torme in fourth position. So it is Turbo's first and second, third and fourth. Then it's Nicky Lauda in fifth position. Bruno Giacomelli is sixth, John Watson is seventh. And Nelson Piquet is right down in eighth position. Well, it seemed a pretty slow start for the cars at the front, but they all got moving in the end, and the turbos held their position. See there, uh, Peroni is nibbling very, very close behind the Renault there, stacking up. We see it really favours the power of the turbos now. These slow corners, followed by medium-length straights, where they could really get their acceleration going, coming out, coming down to the second chicane, field all lined up. But uh, when we get onto the main straights, where the fun goes, a little bit of outbreaking there, but uh, uh, one of the Williams is just snipping through. So, Arnu is in second place behind Cross. Nicky Lauder is starting to close up on Patrick Tombe. Don't forget this is Patrick Tombe's first race in the Ferrari. He's in fourth position. It's Peroni now. One lap completed, 71 to go. Cross leads it to Tarzan. Second gear, there is Arnu behind him. Didier Peroni, the Ferrari handling much better now. It has new front suspension. Well, Piquet pulled a lot of ground on the Ford engine cars. They went down the straight. There is Nelson Piquet. He made up about four places on sheer power muscle from that turbo engine down the straight. He made a poor start from the third base grid position, but as long as he can keep up around the corners, he's going to gobble up the rest of the normally aspirated cars, possibly on the next lap. 
Well, the man to watch at the moment is definitely Didier Pironi. It looks as though Alain Prost is making a bit of a break, clearing some track between himself and his teammate Arnu. and Pironi now is trying to go through on the inside of Arnu. Did he do it? Yes, he has. On lap two, Didier Pironi in the Ferrari is up into second place ahead of René Arnu. So, Renault's first and third, Ferrari's second and fourth, because Patrick Tombay, although I didn't see him in the picture, will still be, I think, in fourth position. We'll check in a moment. Look at the gap. Yes, it is still at PK. It's up into fifth position. Now, the men of the race at the moment, then, as they come through to complete lap two, are definitely Pironi in second place and PK in fifth. So, it's cross leading. Pironi second, Arnu third, then a long gap, and Piquet is pulling through and passing Tombe is up into fifth position. Fourth position, Tombe fifth. Nicky Lauda is in sixth place. Behind Nicky Lauda in seventh place is the distinctive Alfa Romeo, Bruno Giacomelli. Then it's Watson. The first Williams is Katie Rosberg, the white and green car. And we are looking at Nelson Piquet in fourth place. Yes, very encouraging for the BMW engineers to see BK go right past Tombe's Ferrari, and Lauda is having a go at Tombe, and I think he's got through, but in fact, Tombe will have the inside line in the next corner and more power, and uh, sadly for Lauda, his power re-establishes him. This is a problem that Lauda's going to have. I'm sure he could go quicker. The usual problem, Tombe holding him up a bit round the corners. Is Lauda having a nibble? Yes, Lauda's doing that inside. The camera, unfortunately, is on the wrong car, but Lauda can't make it. He's still bashing away, and of course, Giacometti is nibbling behind him, so it's the usual Ferrari chicane. Uh, syndrome, looking him stretch away down the straight. As I was saying about the BMW, that engine just walked past uh, Tom Bay's Ferrari on the straight, and uh, the BMW engineers must be very pleased with that. And what a to the assembly of cars behind Patrick Tombay. There he is, fourth. Now, here are the first three, and see how Didier Pironi is closing up on the leader, Alain Cross in the Renault. This is the fourth lap in this 72-lap race, and Pironi, a man who is tipped by a lot of people for world champion this year, has, is pulling away from Arnu, is closing up on Cross, but the fastest car on the circuit is Nelson Piquet's Brabham BMW. He was doing 203 miles an hour down the street yesterday. Well, although I'm quite sure he's not meaning to, in fact, Patrick Tambo is doing a, a wonderful job for the Ferrari team and for the other turbo cars, because he seems to be holding up all the normally aspirated cars, which I think would be going a lot better. This, this enormous lead that the first three cars have got, and PK now going away from the field. The interesting thing is a little twitch there from Peroni as he put a wheel over the curb on that sli slippery bit there but uh, everything seems to be under control. We're only really going very well indeed, but as I say, Tambe is making sure they've got a nice clear track behind them and they really depress them because he is definitely holding up normally aspirated cars who must be, as usual, bashing their helmets in frustration. Yes, and Reddy Arnu is by himself in third position as we look at the battle for first. Alain Prost, who led the World Championship for some time this year, and now Pironi is going to try and take him as they come down to Tarzan, and he's through. Pironi takes the lead. Well, the man who won at San Marino, Didier Pironi, number 28 in the Ferrari, and who was second at Monaco, third in Detroit, now leads, as many people expected, the Dutch Grand Prix, and we wonder whether the Renaults will suffer from reliability problems. Here's a replay, and you see Pironi come out of the slipstream much better on braking than the Renault, significantly. Takes the right line at the 90-mile-an-hour Tarzan bend, and now it looks to me as though he is already pulling away, and that Alain Prost can do little about it. So Turbo Ferrari leads the two Ren Ren Renaults. Yes, most impressive performance by uh, Peroni and the Ferrari. That's uh, probably the best they've gone in a race. And uh, But the real excitement, of course, is going on behind Patrick Tombe with all the Ford engine cars climbing all over the back of him and over each other in their effort to try and scramble away past. But Peroni seems to be establishing a bit of a lead, getting away. He's, uh, yes, the car looks very well balanced turning in. The car goes light over the hump as they turn into that very quick corner. And... Uh, if there's anything wrong with the handling of the car, it really slows it down there. But Peroni has stretched quite a substantial lead. We see Piquet coming to the picture in fourth place. 
He's holding about station. Since he did there is Tom Bay leading that little gaggle, but of course they're on the straight now and he just stretches away from them. Looks like Lauda still leading the, uh, leading the pursuit. And there goes Rosberg up the inside. They're all arriving together. And we've got Giacomelli trying the outside treatment, but he doesn't make it. Lauda's having down a bit, leans out wide and uh, shuts him out. Looking at the battle for fourth place on lap six, Patrick Torbe in the Scarlet Ferrari four, followed by Nicky Lauda fifth, Bruno Giacometti sixth, Kenny Rosberg in the white and green, Williams is in sixth position, and then behind Rosberg is Riccardo Patrese in the second of the two Brabham BMWs, and then behind Patrese is Warwick. Derek Warwick in the turbocharged Tolman is in eighth position. This is certainly a terrific performance for, for Tolman, far and away their best one. And Derek Warwick on full tanks was very quick indeed this morning in the warm up. So they suddenly found a new breath of life in the performance of their car. Most impressive indeed. And into the pits comes Lafitte in the Ligier. Well, he's coming in a little bit so doesn't it? Yes, he's getting out of the car. So that looks like uh, the end of the beat afternoon as well. There we go. Tambe onto the straight now, using the power of the car. You see how he stretched it out. All the Ford cars are climbing all over the back of him, Lauda still leading the fray, and of course what's particularly good fun behind them is that they're all climbing over each other, there's Rosberg having a go at Giacomelli, two very hard chargers, looks as if Rosberg might just be in a position to do it. Well, we are now on lap seven, and with Didier Pironi leading Alain Prost in second place, Arnoux is third, fourth is Nelson Piquet. In fifth position, it is Patrick Tombe, and there he is. Sixth is Nicky Lauda. Seventh is Bruno Giacomelli. Eighth is Keke Rosberg. And ninth is Derek Warwick. Not eighth. You just saw a flash of the Turbo Tolman there. He was actually fastest in the warm-up until the very, very last stages when Didier Pironi was a bit... No, Nelson Piquet was a bit quicker. But right at the end of the full warm-up period, Derek Warwick was second fastest. And that's a superb effort. Five laps then, that's the order. And as you can see, Nicky Lauda was in sixth position there. There is Torbe ahead. And again, Rosberg is trying to get past Giacomelli. He must be absolutely fuming in the cockpit there because Giacomelli is doing nothing to help him get by. So, Torbe, number 27 in the Ferrari. Nicky Lauda. Yes, Bruno Giacomelli has the ability to be extremely obstructive about being overtaken, and he's a bit of a weaver. Now there's a shot of the feet guy just wiggling. Nicky Lauda and looks very well placed to pass, but Lauda, of course, being in the front, is able to stay in the Ferrari's slipstream, which will help his speed down the straight, whereas Rosberg's got clean out. So they're absolutely side by side. Rosberg has just slipped in front, looked very much on the limit under braking, but he's obviously in real charging mood. Rosberg's driving a, a very good and aggressive race. This then is the battle for fifth position. Keke Rosberg up into sixth place now in the white and green Williams there. Number six, Rosberg, trying very, very hard. Frank Williams, his team owner and manager, was very happy about the car earlier today. There's one spot where I think the Ford engine cars might be able to slip inside the Ferrari. Rosberg wasn't close enough that time, but it requires a certain amount of bravery because you're breaking over a blind brow, and it's a very gentle uh, little dab on the brakes. You'd have to be quite a brave man, you'd have to be very close, but uh, I'm just looking, trying to look from a driver's point of view of where on earth one is going to try and get past this all-powerful Ferrari. Lap nine, and we look at the battle for fifth place between Patrick Tombe, Keke Rosberg, Nicky Lauda, and Ricardo Patrese, with behind them Derek Warwick, that, and Bruno Giacomelli, and in the lead still, of course, it is number 28, which is Didier Pironi in the Ferrari. The fifth place battle completes another lap, which is lap 10 completed in this 72 lap race. Torme still fifth, and now Rosberg is right up behind him. He's going to try and go through on the inside, and he does it. Does he? No. Torme getting back into the Grand Prix groove, and I remind you, it's a long time since he's driven in a Grand Prix. He's driving a fine race. Well, Keke Rosberg putting on a really marvellous display of aggressive, on-the-limit driving. He's driving beautifully. He's given a big side coming out of there last time. Warwick into the pits. You can't see it, unfortunately. He's just gone past our commentary box. 
and that is bitter goal. Very, very hard luck. After a magnificent performance to qualify 13th, to be second fastest in the warm-up today, to be up to ninth position, and Derek Warwick has come into the pits for what reason we know not, but still, Patrick Tombe and Kiki Rosberg battle for fifth. Yes, Rosberg has got to stay close to Tombe now into the, and try and get right up behind him in this next uh, little chicane so that he can be as close as possible for the run onto the straight because this is basically where the straight starts, although they've got that corner. As they come out of here now, it's all acceleration, flat out stuff. And he's got to stay right under the Ferrari's gearbox. I don't know what he's doing there because he can't get inside him there. And he's probably lost some time. He's not close enough now probably to get the proper toe. He was in a better place last lap. And I really thought he was going to do it, but Tombe must have braked very late indeed to be able to fight off the lighter Ford engine car. Lauda is losing touch a little bit to the group now. Lap 11, and Pironi leads. Prost is second. Ardu is third. Two and a half seconds behind Prost in fourth place is Piquet. Fifth is Tombe. Sixth is Rosberg. Seventh is Lauda. Eighth is Giacomelli, and there is Derek Warwick. That was his Tolman in the pits. And it looks as though his race is run, although they may get the car out to continue what would then in effect. And Patrese into the pits. Well, it's significant that the two cars that have come in so far, apart from Lafitte's car, which is out of the race, are both turbo cars. Derek Warwick and now Riccardo Patrese in the Brabham BMW. And we still see this terrific scrap between number 27, Patrick Tombe, the 33-year-old man from Cannes in fifth position, and Kiki Rosberg from Helsinki, although he lives in Monaco, in the Williams, trying to get up past the Ferrari. And as James has said, it is one thing getting to it, it's another game getting past it. But he's firstly placed this time, Murray. He's right behind the Ferrari. He wants to stay behind it and just get sucked along and then nip out of the uh, when they get to the breaking point. He should be able to uh, break the Ferrari, but Tombe is a hard man to pass. We saw him break. There he goes. There goes Rosberg. He's got the inside. He's done it this time. He's just got his nose in front. He's inside Tombe, and he's got the twisty section of the track in front of him, so he should be able to get enough air between him and the Ferrari not to be gobbled up next time they hit the long straight. He's absolutely flying around here now. The Ferrari, I noticed, was particularly so around this Pinsor and first gear corner there in, yes. Rosberg drawing away, and uh, he looks definitely as if he's going to have enough space to stay in front when they hit the straight. Lauda is struggling to hold on a little bit. I think uh, Delmbe's got a little bit, bit quicker, settled into his stride, but Rosberg is certainly flying. It'll be interesting to see what that's like. Here we see him again, just nipping out, normal, conventional overtaking manoeuvre, towed up behind the Ferrari. Just before the braking area nipped out, gave himself a clear sight. Look at the car bouncing. You see how bumpy it is on these solid suspension. Just the tyres working as springs, really. The car just bouncing on its big tyres. Rosberg really bouncing. Yes, there was an enormous amount of trouble with what is called porpoising on that straight, where the cars literally, as James has said, bounce up and down. And as they bounce up, they lose some of the downforce and then go down again. And the drivers eyeballs are almost literally shaking in their heads so great is the vibration so kiki rosberg then there is prost in second place the leader of course bill pironi there is arnu in third position and nelson pk in the brabham bmw four kiki rosberg now in fifth place lap 13 now and it is pironi prost arnu pk rosberg then Tombe, Lauda, behind Lauda is Bruno Giacomelli, then Derek Daly, behind Derek Daly is John Watson, and after John Watson, Andrea de Cesaris, and this is René Arnu being chased by Nelson Piquet. Two one and a half litre engines, the V6 Renault Turbo there, and the four cylinder. BMW, about 560 horsepower. You see the little flashes of flame under the wing of the BMW as he was braking then on the overrun. These turbo cars spit an awful lot of flame. It can be quite dramatic. Well, PK dropped right back there, just as I thought he was going to be uh, on our news tail, ready to have a go at him. He seems he must have made a little mistake there coming out because he's dropped back a bit, but uh, it was obviously only a temporary setback because he's running healthily down the straight. These are a little bit spread out. Pironi has a four-second lead or a little bit more over Frost. Not the excitement that we're seeing behind, but Piquet is lining himself up to position himself for an, for an overtaking shot. But as yet, we haven't seen him really get...
get into the groove. He's not quite close enough to have a go right now. Lap 14. Pironi now just five seconds ahead of Prost. Arnu, Piquet, that's the battle for third that we're looking at now. Keke Rosberg ahead of Tombe, who is sixth. Lauda, seventh. Bruno Giacomelli, eighth. Daly, ninth. Watson, tenth. De Cesaris, eleventh. De Angelis, twelfth. Michele Alvareto, thirteenth. Baldi, fourteenth. And Chico Serra in fifteenth place. And by the way, two or three of the teams have got a new Demon Pirelli tyre which helped Derek Warwick on his way and now Piquet is right up with Arnu, and we've noticed race after race recently that the Renaults do start to will from the BMW's do Yes, I think Piquet may have a little problem with the turbo lag there. He seems to lose ground in the middle of that corner just when you'd be going on to the power, but he's close enough. And with, and with the power he showed when he went past Tombe's car, he's a beautiful pace. And uh, as I say, it looks like he's got a straight line speed advantage. So, but he's got the wrong side of the corner, but he's through and clear, so he's OK. So that BMW is really putting out plenty of power. That's most, most impressive that he's able, been able to get comfortably past both uh, the turbo Renault and the turbo Ferrari. So PK up into third place, comfortably done, but not looking very threatening to the two leaders who uh, got some, he's got something like five or more seconds to make up. On Frost, here we see it again, again getting the, the draft down the straight. He's in uh, a hole in the air made very kindly for him by the Renault. Now he's out in clear air, but he's already going quicker than him. His momentum carries him clear. Look at them bouncing again. It really must be very, very uncomfortable for the drivers. It's now over three years since I drove a Grand Prix car and they were pretty uncomfortable then but they have got an awful lot worse well into the pit comes Mark Sura in his arrows that is uh, one of the Pirelli users that I was telling you about and it looks as though uh, things are not quite as uh, happy as I said they were because his tires are being changed whilst they are being changed it gives me a chance to tell you that Nelson Piquet was consistently yesterday doing at over 197 miles an hour down the street and at one point where he pulled out yesterday to pass René Arnoux as he has just done here today in the race he was timed at 203 miles an hour and you can see the distinctive BMW colours of the rear aerofoil at the back of the Brabham and you can see too the René Arnoux and there he is in fourth position now and look at the flowers overnight the Dutch have been out and around many of the corners they have planted thousands and thousands of flowers a very very colourful sight which René Arnoux certainly won't be enjoying this is Nelson Piquet in uh, third position well Piquet seventh in the world championship he is the reigning world champion and has only 11 points this year because although he won in brazil he was subsequently disqualified for a technical infringement his car is not on fire you'll see flashes of flame you'll see flashes of flame come out when he goes on to the overrun that's a characteristic of some of the turbos the bmws still do it the ferraris do it the tolmans do it but the Renaults do not. And there is Prost. Now you see the gap between Prost, who was his second. There is Nelson Piquet in third position. And uh, I'm going to put a stopwatch on the difference between Piquet, who is just going into the second gear, right-handed Tarzan corner. One of the few places that you can pass on this uh, circuit. He's now into Gala. Changes down to into second gear around Hugenholz which for those people who are watching Channel 9 is where Alan Jones lost his lead a couple of years ago at that exact point where Arnu is now in fourth position. Now they go on to the Rob Slotomacher bend. It's 150 miles an hour here. Round to Sky Black, 140 miles an hour. Some of the cars actually lose adhesion there and you'll see a puff of smoke from the rear tires as they bite again. Now down to the Marlborough chicane second gear about uh, 90 miles an hour through here accelerate away and there is Jan Lammers the Dutchman who actually lives here at Zandvoort and just qualified for the race and Ricardo Patrese I see is back in the race so he has been into the pits and out and uh, we are 
are now on lap 17 out of 72 as we look at in the Theodore car, Dutchman Jan Lammers, who broke his thumb in the Detroit Grand Prix, had it pinned, the most gruesome sight, because he was showing me the metal pin sticking through the bone and out of his flesh, and it's now been removed, and he says he's suffering no pain, and he certainly needs to suffer no pain, because this is a very demanding circuit under any circumstances. The team of fast 12 to 14 Angestellte, the great works of Renault Ferrari, have now bereits already up to 200 Mitarbeiter. Der Theodor ist etwas übergewichtig, schaut auch ein bisschen plump aus. Das Gewicht der Formel 1 Wagen wird ja wahrscheinlich bereits ab dem nächsten Rennen in Brands Hatch oder ab dem übernächsten in Le Castellet reduziert. Und zwar im Augenblick ist es immer noch 580 Kilo. Into the pits. Lap 18, Pironi leads, Prost second, Piquet third, Arnoux fourth, Rosberg fifth, Tombe sixth, Lauda seventh, Giacomelli eighth, Daly ninth, and John Watson leading the world championship in tenth position as into the pits comes Chico Serra. Well, after an absolutely storming session over the opening few laps with some very good racing indeed, particularly to Marv, driving by Kenki Rosberg, things seem to have settled up now. The leaders are all rather spread out, but processional. Uh, interesting point is whether Rosberg can make any impression on the turbo. He's been keeping the gap at about 11 seconds. He's closed it very slightly. He's making no real inroads into the turbo, the lead that was established while he was... Uh, up behind Tom Bay and the group in the uh, Tom Bay's Ferrari. But uh, behind the only real battle of the race, Tom Bay, Lauda, Giacomelli and Derek Daly all battling away for sixth place with Tom Bay frustrating all their efforts with the power of his turbo engine every time he gets on the straight. But there's still a major scrap going on there for sixth place. And a very interesting point as we look at Didier Pironi leading his second Grand Prix because he won at uh, San Marino. And there is Derek Warwick out of the race definitely this time because he's out of his car. Uh, and uh, the position 13 there is on the Sky Black corner, I'm pretty certain, approaching the Marlborough chicane as Didier Pironi is coming up now to complete his 18th, 19th lap and lap Raul Vercel in the March car, that's the Brazilian who is driving for the first time in Holland because he was a Formula 3 driver last year moves over, lets Didier Pironi, the race leader, through and uh, Pironi has got a commanding enough lead over Alain Prost and now, some six seconds behind Prost, it's Piquet. But I was saying, of interest in the World Championship situation, is that John Watson, who is leading Didier Pironi, and there is Pironi, by ten points in the World Championship, is not actually in the points at the present moment, because he is in tenth position. Didier Pironi there is in the running for nine points if he finishes this race in the position that he's in now, in which case... John Watson would go into the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch just one point ahead of Pironi. But there's uh, a long, long way to go in this race before we start making forecasts like that. They are now on lap 20, Pironi leading. And uh, when you see the front of the Ferrari, for those of you who are technically interested, and here he is coming through to complete his 20th lap, have a look at the suspension because it is the new pull rod suspension of the type that is used by uh, Tyrrell and by one or two other manufacturers and it has significantly improved the handling of the Ferrari. Now, there is Prost in second place and the gap between Prost and Piquet is now only four seconds. So once again, it looks as though the Renaults have flattered to deceive a bit although they are in second and fourth places, but we do expect so much from them after their inevitable and quite usual scintillating performances in practice. But Ferrari seem to have got the mixture, literally, right and better than the Renaults. The Ferraris have got uh, water 
injection in their engines which makes them run cooler and produces more power. There is Prost second and there behind him you saw Nelson Piquet. Lap 21 out of 72, Alain Prost. Second. Keep looking in the picture for Nelson Piquet, although they are staying with the Frenchman. You'll see Piquet now, there he is. And all the time he's getting just a tiny bit closer. There's the Brazilian, the reigning world champion, Nelson Piquet third. Yes, the has really had uh, what for them one has to describe as a dreadful season. They've uh, shown the best form in qualifying. They've got the fastest uh, chassis engine combination. Alan Prost has uh, driven particularly well. He's a very, very mature driver, one of the very best in the business now, and they've broken down an awful lot, which uh, after their whoops, and there's a wheel flying about, I can't see a car, so somebody has crashed there, there goes the thing, it looked like quite a bit, oh, it's a terrible big shot, and it looks like one of the Renaults, as the driver's moving around inside. It's Rene Arnoux, I'm almost certain, yes, it's Rene Arnoux, and you can see that he's still in the cockpit, Yes, he's gone straight on at the end of the straight. Whether he lost his brakes, locked them up or anything, we just can't tell. And looking down, I can't see the end of the straight from our comfortable position. Too many big black marks on the road. There's the replay. It's Tarzan Corner. And Arnu off comes the wheel. And Arnu did exactly what Derek Daly did a couple of years ago. Ploughed into the barrier at the end of the straight. Well, that wheel seems to be off before he hit anything, so it looks to me as if, as if a wheel fell off the car, po possibly and probably causing the accident. Couldn't see quite enough from that action replay to see he may just have hit something first and detached the wheel, but they're having a bit of a struggle to get him out. I think the front of the car is pretty flat, and he appeared to go in head on. He's nearly mounted the barrier. We have to remember that the car is doing something like 190 miles an hour when he's coming into the braking area, so that's a very heavy shunt indeed. The sand in front of it, and... Uh, that's Brian Henson and his Tyrrells doing a bit of mechanical work on the side of the track. Henson. And uh, Arnu doesn't look too well. I think he's got leg damage. But they are succeeding in getting him out. Well, poor Rene Arnu, I have said time and time again, his helmet is off. He is obviously in considerable pain from the expression on his face. Thankfully, the medical facilities here at Sand Court are absolutely first class. But Rene Arnu has clearly done what Derek Daly did and what John Watson did. He has gone straight on at uh, Tarzan and his car ploughed into the tyre barrier, went over the Armco. You can see that the front of the Renault is considerably deformed. The driver's feet are... And here's a replay. Now watch and you see the wheel is already off, as James has pointed out. Now you see the wheel come into the picture. So, as a, as a surmise, it would appear that the Renault wheel came off and caused the accident rather than a driver error. Well, we can uh, only guess that that is the case, but meantime, with Arnu thankfully out of the car and being hastened away to uh, the medical centre, Didier Pironi, there he is, ahead of... Jan Lammers is in the lead. Alain Prost is in second position. Nelson Piquet is in third position. Up to fourth place, of course, now comes Keki Rosberg as we look at the Renault astride the Armco at Tarzan. And, and uh, we are now, by the way, on lap 24 out of 72. So, to recap, lap 24 out of 72, Didier Pironi leads with Rene Arnoux, who was in fourth position, crashed out of the race. In second position, Alain Prost in the sole remaining Renault. In third position, Nelson Piquet. And we're getting spots of rain on the glass of our commentary box. Not yet enough, I wouldn't have thought, to wet the track, but it's certainly spitting. And the clouds overhead are fairly high, but uh, that will really throw the cat among the pigeons. If we get a little enough spot, somebody coming into the pit, so I couldn't see who it was. Well, he will be coming into our sight as Pironi now goes past one of the ATS cars and the man coming into the pits was Jean-Pierre Jarrier in the Ocella and Didier Pironi is on his way. Now, if it is going to rain and uh, 
the weather here at Zandport, which is literally within yards of the North Sea, is totally unpredictable. It's Eliseo Salazar, incidentally, in the ATS, who has been lapped by Didier Pironi. Salazar, who I unjustly accused of having failed to qualify in a race uh, when I was talking in a previous Grand Prix about him, has in fact qualified for all of them, but has now been lapped by the flying Didier Pironi, who is a long way now ahead of Alain Prost on lap 25, PK third, Rosberg fourth. Up to fifth position comes Patrick Tombe in the second of the two Ferraris, then Nicky Lauda in sixth position, Giacomelli is seventh, Daly is eighth, Watson is in ninth position, De Angelis in the John Player Special is tenth, then De Cesaris eleventh, Michele Amoretto twelfth. Früh an und zwar hat äh, Lafitte gesagt, ich möchte die Gewissheit haben, wenn irgendetwas am Auto bricht, wenn ich in dieser Kurve stürze, dass ich möglichst viel Auslauf habe und möglichst nicht direkt gegen diesen Wall, diesen Schutzwall aus Gummireifen und Brei. Und auch auf dieser Geraden verändern die Fahrer immer wieder ihre Linie. Sie sehen diese Zickzack-Bewegung, hier immer noch der ausgeschiedene Tyrell von Brian Henson. Diese Bewegungen sind nicht deshalb oder nicht immer deshalb, um einen Gegner aus dem Windschatten zu schütteln, sondern die Fahrer versuchen sozusagen, wir haben das gesehen bei Alain Prost, zwischen den Bodenwellen eine Ideallinie zu finden. Sicherlich ist Alain Prost jetzt etwas beunruhigt gewesen durch den Blick auf den ausgeschiedenen Wagen seines Teamkollegen René Arnoux, weil Prost ja nicht wissen kann, was an diesem Auto passiert ist, ob irgendetwas gebrochen ist, was wir alle vermuten, seit wir dieses Rad wegfliegen gesehen haben. Das ist ein äh, psychologisches Problem natürlich auch, mit dem der Fahrer jetzt fertig werden muss. Ich kann mich erinnern, Lafitte hatte vor zwei Jahren hier als Entführung lag und nachdem er das Wrack des äh, Tirelfahrers Derek Daly in dieser Kurve gesehen hat, einen äh, solchen Schreck erlitten, dass er künftig äh, bis ans Ende des Rennens eigentlich in jeder Runde zwei Sekunden langsamer fuhr als zuvor. Und das war auch der Grund, warum Lafitte dann kurz vor Ende des Rennens überholt wurde und den Graubri von Holland verloren hat. Immer noch der verunglückte Renault Turbo von René Ardu. Prost Renault. And Prost is now, according to that caption, just about 2.8 seconds ahead of uh, PK. Now there's the gap, you can see it for yourself. They're just going past us. I'll give you the exact gap as far as time is concerned. And it is 2.7 seconds. Nelson Piquet here, the world champion, seventh in the world championship at the moment with 11 points, having been disqualified after his Brazil victory, fifth in Belgium. Then he failed to start in San Marino because of the political problems. And he didn't finish in South Africa or Long Beach or Monaco. But uh, he won at Canada, and this is the first race after Canada, and the BMW, the German BMW technicians have really been working on this four-cylinder car with its very specialized electronic injection system, and it's now producing a reliable 580 brake horsepower, and Nelson Piquet is making full use of them. He's gaining on Alain Frost. And watch how steadily this Gordon Murray designed car rides. It is very noticeable that on the long straight from Boss Wheat and Hutsarenflak down to Tarzan, the Brabham doesn't porpoise at all, it just rides on the tires. Now, there is Prof in the background, there is Nelson Piquet. I'll give you the gap again, it was 2.6 seconds last time they went through, and the gap now is 2.4 seconds between the second and third men, and we are on lap 28. Pironi leads, Ross second, Piquet third, Rosberg fourth, Tolbe fifth, Lauda sixth, Giacomelli seventh, Daly eighth, and there is number six, Kenny Rosberg in fourth position in the Williams, in the points. Yes, valiant effort by Kenny Rosberg, he is... Uh Winning, if you like, what will come to be known on the fast circuits as the B race for the non-turbocharged cars, and very nicely is winning it too. But he is, in fact, losing ground uh, to PK, who's extended his lead quite a lot out to uh, 15 seconds now over Rosberg. So he's falling slowly back. PK is just edging slowly, slowly 
closer, but uh, not really making much impression. But at least uh, we're going to have some action there when uh, CK can finally get right onto the tail of uh, Frost Renault. There is Rosberg going very steadily now. He's got a small lead over Patrick Tombe. Well, small lead, he's got about 10 seconds. He's well clear of that. And then, of course, Tombe is following up behind with his... Uh, with his little tail of Ford engine cars still still scrambling away and still making no impression. There is the battle. There is Dombe. There is Lauda right behind him. Giacomelli still behind Lauda. And Derek Daly, I think you'll find, has come up to join that group. We'll see in the background. And Watson is up onto the back of it, I think, as well. No? And meantime, as we look at Tombe in fifth position with uh, Lauda and uh, Giacomelli behind him, I can tell you that Nelson Piquet has carved a great lump out of the lead that Alain Frost has over him. It is down now to 1.5 seconds. So, this is the battle for fifth on lap 29. Tombe in fifth place, number eight, Nicky Lauda in the Marlboro McLaren in sixth position. Then, that small gap and behind Nicky Lauda is Bruno Giacomelli and uh, into the pits come Elio De Angelis who was well down the running indeed uh, below 15th position and uh, yes there's the man John Watson now is coming up well he's in ninth place but this is the battle for fifth again Tornby in the Ferrari his first drive His first drive for Ferrari, that is, of course, a very experienced campaigner, is Patrick Tombe, and we look down now from the helicopter as they go into Panorama. Patrick Tombe, behind him, Nicky Lauda, fifth and sixth. Then Bruno Giacomelli is seventh. Now, Elio De Angelis, who we have just seen coming into the pits, was challenging... John Watson for ninth position as Nicky Lauda is challenging Patrick Tornbay for fifth. And he's close enough to get through here. That's Tarzan. But Patrick Tornbay closed the door in his face. And the two of them, as we look at Elio De Angelis in the John Player Special, it's obviously some trouble underneath the front of the car. They've got it jacked up. They haven't changed tyres. Meantime, the Ferrari and uh, Lauda are still chasing each other. Now, we have good news, and that is that René Arnoux has got no broken bones. We have got this news from the Renault pit, and after crashing out of the race at over 190 miles an hour when his car came, when his wheel came off, René Arnoux is apparently OK, and uh, very, very good news indeed. Yes, that's marvellous news. On the rather scrambled picture we had uh, of a replay of that accident, it appeared to me, I don't know whether you saw that line, that, that two wheels had come off the car, and the whole of his left side, he appeared to have lost his left front and rear, and it couldn't have been in contact with another car, because he was all on his own at the time, unless he was lapping a back marker that we didn't spot. And look at that, Nelson Piquet is ahead of Alain Prost as we rejoin. We've been watching this and wondering when the pictures are going to come back to this battle. And now there is the excitement on lap 31 out of 72 coming up to the half distance. Nelson Piquet, the brilliant 29-year-old Brazilian from Brasilia who lives in Monaco. and This is his 56th Grand Prix has fought his way up through the field and has now displaced Alain Prost, moved up into second position. There is the Frenchman in the Renault in the background. And uh, so Prost is now third. Rosberg is now in fourth position. And uh, there's a considerable gap, of course, between Prost and Rosberg. I'm doing some quick mental arithmetic while I talk to you. It's about 16 seconds, but... I wonder whether Nelson Piquet, who is driving absolutely magnificently, there's the flash of the turbo plane coming out of the turbo exit as he backs off with Alain Prost now behind him. Nelson Piquet, who has driven in his career for Ensign, for McLaren, for Brabham, 
has six pole positions, three second places. He's won seven Grand Prix, and he's now up to second place in the Dutch Grand Prix of 1982, in which, uh, by the way, he finished in second place last year to Alain Prost. So he's got his revenge over the Frenchman because he's got ahead of him in 1982. Well, lap 32 we are on now. Pironi leads there, Piquet second, Frost and Rosberg third and fourth, with the second Ferrari of Patrick Torbay ahead of Nicky Lauda. And uh, therefore there are two three-litre cars in the top six. They are, of course, those of Katie Rosberg, who is in fourth place, and Nicky Lauda, who is in sixth position. Chased by seventh, Bruno Giacomelli. Eighth, Derek Daly. And in ninth position, John Watson. That's Raoul Vassell. And there is Nelson Piquet, second, Tarzan. Well, Nicky, Nicky Lauda must be dying of frustration sitting behind the Ferrari, but uh, he was a... There's P.K. just slipping past the back marker, who very politely and correctly makes room for him. But uh, Lauda really must be very frustrated. He was the fastest four-engine car, a three-litre, normally aspirated car, in the qualifying. He was quicker than Rosberg. Here he is again, Lauda, still just that little bit behind Tom Bay, just not quite close enough to have a go. But uh, Rosberg managed it, and I think that Lauda is definitely being held up. So it would be interesting to see what he could do if he, if he was only to get by. He doesn't seem to... Rosberg was really driving with a great deal of power and fought his way around the Ferrari. Lauda doesn't seem, maybe his car isn't quite quick enough on the straight, but he doesn't seem to be able to do what uh, Rosberg was able to do in his Williams. Well, and uh, British enthusiasts ought to stand up and cheer who saw that caption. And that looks like Andrew de Cesaris. Yes, it is. Andrew de Cesaris in the pits. But that caption said that the fastest lap of the race so far was put up by Derek Warwick, 1 minute 19.8, which is just outside René Arnoux's 1980 lap record. And that will really and justifiably get the tails of the Tolman team right up. Rory Byrne and John Gentry are back in England putting the final touches to the new car, which is going to be announced on August the 15th. And the way the Brian Hart Tolman motor is going, then that's a Renault going very slowly indeed. It's Prost. Prost coming into the pits. It has happened again. Arnoux has gone out through no fault of his, I think. But Alain Prost is coming into the pits. So once again, and this is getting far too frequent, we think, the Renaults have done magnificently in practice, only to fail in the race. Yes, it's, they're having a, a, a terrible season, as I was saying earlier, Murray, and they really have to examine their own house and put this in order because this can't just be bad luck with the cars constantly breaking down. The team has been in a certain amount of organisational disarray earlier in the year and in what should really be their year with the performance of their cars, they, were, they were, have been absolutely dominant in the qualifying. They really should have been getting some better results and it's very, very disappointing. And one has to, uh, I think, really examine the management and the operation of the Renault team to see what the trouble is. Because the cars are breaking down, they've had misfires here and little things that really shouldn't go wrong, especially in the top team. There's Perona, just going on his steady way, leading the race very comfortably. Well, the interesting thing is, with uh, Prost out of the race, that Rosberg moves up into third position, and all the time, of course, John Watson is making up places. He is now in ninth position. That is three places off a point-scoring position. And Didier Pironi, number 28, who is now leading Nelson Piquet, who is in second place by just about uh, half a minute. He's got a very considerable lead over Piquet. And Nicky Lauda, who is now in fifth place, chasing Patrick Torbay, number 27, who is fourth. In sixth position, Alain Prost was and is now slipped down, so that means to say that John Watson is now up into eighth position. John Watson, eighth, world championship leader. And we look at uh, the Rob Slutter Maccabens up to Sky Black. Torn Bay in the red Ferrari with his distinctive blue helmet, chased by Nicky Lauda. Torn Bay fourth, Nicky Lauda fifth.
Well, it would seem at this stage of the race, because we are now at the half distance point, 36 laps, which is the half distance lap in this 72 lap race, that Pironi has simply to keep going in order to win, because he has a very considerable lead over Nelson Piquet, and brilliant as the Brazilian is, there is no way I can see him being able to reduce the gap between himself and Pironi unless Pironi has trouble. And now, Lauda is going to try and go through and take Patrick Torpe, who is fourth. Well, it's so close, so near, but yet so far, he's very, very near. He got inside from it, on this sliding about switching out of the corner. But uh, he's re-established, and that's as close as we've seen now to get. And he's really going to have to do something to get past this Ferrari because he's still has the chance of uh, chasing Rosberg. They're only something like 12 seconds behind Keke Rosberg, and uh, that time, but they're running out of time if uh, Lada can't get by. We don't know what his uh, speed capability is on his own, because, of course, he's been uh, stuck behind this uh, almost immovable object, except down the street, uh, throughout the race. We are now just over the half distance. Lap 37. Pironi leads, and you can see the gap between himself and Piquet second. Rosberg third, Tombe fourth, Lauda fifth, Giacomelli is in sixth place, Derek Daly is seventh. In eighth position, it is Michele Alvareto. In ninth place, John Watson. So, Alvareto and Watson are now very close. John Watson is starting a charge behind this lot, and there is Elio De Angelis bouncing his way down the straight, having rejoined the race into Tarzan, ahead of Jan Lammers, who is in 13th place, the Dutchman, number 33, in the Theodore car. Still recovering from his broken thumb, but he has qualified in his home Grand Prix. He is the hero of Holland, and rightly so. Bruno Giacomelli, who's still shadowing that uh, uh, Tombe Lauda battle, dropped back a little bit, and it sounds to me like he's got a broken exhaust pipe. It engine sounds very rough, but it can't be that rough, because he's still holding off Derek Daly, who's stuck behind him, and uh, he's keeping pretty close to the battle in front. It uh, doesn't knock a lot of power off, it doesn't half make the engine sound horrible, but uh, he's been like that for a few laps now, so he seems to be settled into his new funny noise without any problems. Well, whilst we go round Zandvoort with the Elio De Angelis versus Jan Lammers battle on the course, there is Nelson Piquet in second position. He has now completed 37 laps, and uh, he chases unavailingly at the moment Didier Pironi in the Ferrari, who seems to be on his way to his second Grand Prix win of 1982. He has already won two Grand Prix, Pironi I'm talking about, and Nelson Piquet won't be able to do very much about the gap between himself and the Ferrari, but it does look at the present moment as though we are going to have two different makes of turbo in the top two places. Well, we can't see it on the screen, but Lauda was definitely inside bright, and there he is, he is through. I saw him as they went past the pit, he was closer than ever before. He's overtaken at the right moment, he's now got a whole lap to put enough air between him, and he's just streaking away from Tombe. So now we've got to see if Lauda can... Uh, Set about catching Rosberg, who's got all something like uh, 14 seconds uh, lead over him. And Watson has just come into the pits. Andres, we haven't seen it, but Watson in the pits. Yes, John Watson has driven past and underneath our commentary position, and there is the confirmation of it with a very lumpy sounding engine. Now, Nicky Lauda had tremendous drama earlier today. There he is, number eight, Nicky Lauda, who is in fourth position now ahead of Patrick Torbay, because at the end of the warm-up period, and uh, that finished at uh, 10.30 Dutch time, which is an hour later than you in the UK, and heaven knows what the difference it is between here and Australia, but Nicky Lauda came in at the end of the warm-up period with a distinctly rough engine. The race was starting. Here's the replay of Lauda getting past Tombe, who looks over his shoulder despairingly, can do nothing about it. Lauda passed at the traditional place at the uh, Zandvoort circuit, the end of the straight and Tarzan corner. And uh, I still haven't finished telling you that uh, Lauda's engine was changed between the end of the warm-up period and the beginning of the race. And there is John Watson, obviously back in the race, 
so and he's uh, just ahead of his teammate Nicky Lowder he moves over lets the Austrian through because he knows of course that Nicky is uh, in with a chance of some excellent points because he's uh, on his way to three points Nicky Lauder, if he can maintain his fourth position at the present moment in the world championship well the way he streaked away from Tom they once passed and they look at that lead now, Tom, they almost out of picture. We just caught a good two. The way he streaked away from him, he should, I would think, be going to catch Rosberg. So we've, we've got a potential scrap for the leaders of the B race, Lauder and Rosberg. Rosberg has uh, quite a substantial lead of over 15 seconds on Lauder at the moment. We'll get the watch on it and uh, see how it's going. But he's really going quickly at the moment, Nicky. Lap 40 out of 72, Didier Pironi leads. Nelson Piquet second, Rosberg third, Lauder fourth. Tormbay, fifth, Derek Daly, sixth and in the point. Then, seventh, Giacomelli, eighth, Alvareto, ninth, Mauro Baldi, tenth, John Watson, who has slipped down, of course, now that he's been into the pits, eleventh, Jochen Marsden, twelfth, Eliseo Salazar. You hear James and I talk laughingly about the A of B races because it is clear that as the turbo cars demonstrated by Renault, Ferrari, BMW and increasingly now Tolman are developed, they are so much faster than the normally aspirated 3-litre Ford V8 engine cars which have ruled Grand Prix racing for so long. That, provided the turbos last, they in effect have a race amongst themselves. But they don't always last long enough. Pironi is in a turbo in the lead and looking good for another race win. Piquet is second in a different make of turbo, the German BMW-powered Brabham, and looking good for second place. Ketty Rosberg leads the three-meter race, as it were, in third position, with Nicky Lauda here in fourth place, some 15 seconds behind Rosberg, but we're going to put a watch on them and see what the gap is and see whether Lauda is gaining on the finish driver. Then, fifth position, Patrick Tombe in his first race for Ferrari. A very, very good effort. Six, Derek Daly, and those are the points positions at the moment. Lauda passes and laps. Jan Lammers down into Tarzan. And we are now on lap 41 out of 72. There is certainly one of the greatest Grand Prix drivers of all time. Nicky Lauda, who is in his 121st Grand Prix. And uh, he's won 18 of them. He's finished second 15 times. He's finished third seven times. There is Pironi. Well, Ferrari, very much a name to conjure with. One of the most exciting and emotional names in Grand Prix racing. And there is Pironi ahead of Riccardo Patrese. That's the blue and white car that we're looking at now. And Patrese is well down the running because he has been into the pits. And that's in the second of the two Brabham BMWs. Well, as I'm sad to say, it doesn't look as if we're going to get a battle in the B race because although Nicky Lada is catching Kenny Rosberg very, very slightly, it's only a matter of a tenth or two per lap and uh, he's going to run out of laps before he can crack that sort of a lead so unless he can find uh, Nicky can find a slightly higher gear or Keki slows it down a bit they're going to still they're going to finish still a path on the road while we watch the scarlet ferrari of race leader didier pironi on lap 42 out of 72 a few words about the world championship would come down to only one point Ricardo Patrese, who is third in the World Championship at the present moment, is not by a long, long way in the points. Alain Prost, who is in fourth position in the World Championship, seems to be out of the race. Keki Rosberg, however, who is in fifth position in the World Championship with 17 points, is likely to move up into third position in the World Championship, provided he keeps going where he is now, which is in third position. And Nicky Lauda, who is sixth, will improve his position too. So there is Nelson Piquet, lap 43, 
second position behind uh, Pironi. In third position is Keki Rosberg still. In fourth place is Nicky Lauda. Then in fifth place now, we haven't seen it on the picture, but Derek Daly has moved ahead of Tolbe, who goes down to sixth position and into the pits comes Jan Lammers, who, as I said, was overjoyed to have qualified for his home Grand Prix. And uh, look at that near side front tyre. Look how blistered it is. The left side front tyre here in uh, Holland and Sandport takes a terrific pounding. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's, it's, it's oh, depending on how the car's set up, it's either the front or rear outside tyre. And that's blistered through pure overheating, which uh, could be indicative that other people may be in tyre trouble. And we, we tend to see it in the second half of the race that the tyres are warm a lot. But it seems strange that he blistered the tyre so late in the race because they get hotter. There's Rosberg in uh, pretty clear third place. No trouble at all. Cruising along, louder, not appearing to be a threat behind him and uh, doesn't look any chance really of catching PK ahead unless, of course, one of the two leading cars runs into trouble. But uh, it's strange to miss the tyre straight so late in the race because they build up more heat when they've got more rubber on. Look at that lovely slide. Rosberg really throwing the car about. Joy to watch. He really enjoys his driving. Very much the finished style. They're brought up on slow and ice so they can drive cars backwards until they'll be under control. They're used to sliding all over the place. Diese Reifenfirma, die natürlich nicht nur den Wagen von Lambert, sondern auch einige Spitzenteams ausrüstet, in allererster Linie Williams oder Brettham, hat übrigens drei verschiedene Qualifikationsreifen. Der eine hält genau eine Runde, der andere hält vier Runden und der andere hält sogar zehn Runden lang, ist natürlich entsprechend langsamer. Nur damit Sie wissen, wie also im Training oft die Karten gemischt werden, warum es Teams gibt, die immer wieder vorne auftauchen im Training und andere, die immer wieder überraschen und andere, die immer hinten bleiben und außerdem wird ja im Training unverändert gewogelt mit den Gewichten. Das ist Jean-Pierre Charrier mit dem... And uh, now on lap 45, the positions remain Didier Pironi, who has led right from the early stages of this race. Indeed, he took the lead on lap 5 and he now holds it on lap 45 from Nelson Piquet, who has, I think, little chance of catching the Frenchman in the Italian Ferrari who leads. In third position, Kiki Rosberg, and I don't think he's got any chance of catching uh, Piquet. In fourth position, no change there, Nicky Lauda, who has displaced, of course, Tombe, who is now down to sixth position with Daly in fifth place. And in seventh position is Bruno Giacomelli, eighth is Michele Alvareto, and we see now the ninth man, Balvin. And Alvareto has just slipped past Giacomelli going to have in the still that little gaggle of cars. And meanwhile, Pironi has caught them up, is trying to lap them, but they're so busy fighting each other, understandably. Tombe has got out of the way. Now, it's the most extraordinary maneuvers going on. Tombe, I think, saw what was happening behind, went to start letting people through. But uh, Alvareto was the only person who was interested in getting past at that stage. Uh, Giacomelli, I think, has let the Ferrari through, dropped back a bit as a result. So we'll see what happens, because this is a chance for Alvareto driving yet again, a very good race indeed. He's really come on extremely well this year, driven very steadily and very quickly at times when his car has been up to it, and he's certainly putting on a good show here, and it'll be interesting to see if he can fight his way past Tolbe. Yes, Michele Alvareto, who many people thought might be offered a place in the Ferrari team after Gilles Villeneuve's tragic death, but uh, Enzo Ferrari himself is very, very cautious about appointing. There goes, uh, I was going to say, there goes Pironi past Alboreto, but he doesn't. But Al uh, now Alboreto is ahead of Colbe, and so has Pironi lapped his teammates. So it is now on lap 47, Pironi leading PK second, Rosberg third, Lauda fourth, Daly fifth, and up into sixth position has gone Alvareto. Most extraordinary. Alvareto's tour went down the straight like a turbocharged guy. He appeared to pull away from Tombe, so one has a suspicion that the Ferraris may be losing a bit of power. Ferrari's got a big enough lead, I think, for that not to be a problem for him. But you see, look at that Tyrrell just streaking away, and Tombe is definitely falling back. So it may be they're getting an overheating problem or something, but they both seem to be struggling against the Tyrrell. And Alvareto is going at a huge speed there. 
Well, now, let us watch this very carefully because the gap between Didier Pironi, and who is leading, and that we're looking at now, on lap 47 and Nelson Piquet has come down to 26 seconds, and it was over 30 seconds. James has suggested that the Ferraris may be losing power. You can see that uh, Pironi either can't or doesn't want to get ahead of Alvareto. I can't believe it's the latter. Alvareto is in the Ford V8 powered car. Now Peroni is, I think, going to surge past him on the straight. Yes, he seems to go past him fairly comfortably then, but not didn't really gobble him up. It's uh, hard to say, but if they have both lost out together the Ferraris, it's a, it's a, it does, it says, in a way, good things for their, the standard of their engineering, because if you can get the same fader at the same length of life for a car, it means you've at least put everything together exactly right and beautifully matched, although you've probably got your design wrong. But uh, Alfred is still holding on to Peroni very well indeed. So Peroni is definitely not going as quickly, and of course, you've been a big hurry now, because you'll be aware that his uh, lead is being eked away by PK, who still looks in excellent health. Yes, and Pironi, of course, has now lapped everybody up to fifth place now that he has got uh, past Alvareto, who is in sixth position. And on lap 48 out of 72, this man, number 22, Didier Pironi, the Frenchman in the Ferrari, leads the Dutch Grand Prix by 26 seconds from Nelson Piquet's second. Katie Rosberg, 13 seconds behind Piquet in third position. Nicky Lauda fourth, Derek Daly in fifth position, and Brun and uh, Alvareto in sixth place. Now we're looking at the exit from Boss Wheat, the 145 mile an hour right-hander, watching Didier Pironi go through to complete his 48th lap into the right-hander at Tarzan, which is uh, where the unfortunate René Arnoux went off and I say again, we had the news from the Renault pits but notwithstanding the fact that René Arnoux had gone off at about 190 miles an hour slammed straight into the tyre barrier behind which was the solid metal Armco there is Piquet in second position Arnoux appears to be perfectly alright both the turbo Ferrari and the turbo Brabham flash of flame as PK goes from Tarzan into Gerlach, second gear. Now round Hugenholz, the second gear left-hander, accelerates away, third gear. Up into fourth for the Rob Slotter Maccabens, 150 miles an hour. Now up the hill into Sky Black, down towards the top straight, such as it is, and the Marlborough the new chicane, built in 1980 to replace the one which uh, Jody Schechter was uh, to some extent responsible for and which was not at all liked by the drivers and Nelson Piquet in second position then this Brazilian driver has doggedly decided to risk his world championship this year in order to do what he thinks is the right thing which is to devote all his energies and attention to developing the new turbocharged BMW engine, which he com is convinced is the way to go. And it looks as though he is right. We just saw Kiki Rosberg there in uh, third position. Well, the gap between Rosberg and PK is now some 11 seconds. And it looks as though Rosberg is gaining. There he is. There is the very, very determined, hard-charging Finnish driver, Teddy Rosberg, in his 45th Grand Prix in the very cobby-looking FW08 Williams. The car that has replaced the enormously successful FW07 Williams, which took Alan Jones to his world championship and nearly gave Carlos Reutemann a world championship last year. And Rosberg as ever, is fighting every inch of the way. You can see him as he comes out of Sky Black there with the car sliding under perfect control. Challenging or trying to challenge Nelson Piquet for second position. And we're now on lap 51 in this 72 lap, 190.2 mile race. 
Vicky Brosburn. This is the panorama then. Fourth gear here, into Boss Wheats, 145 miles an hour. He goes round this right-hander, believe it or not. Into the long straight at Hootson. Now, building up to 190 miles an hour, it seems, and they don't back off until they get to the 100-meter to the board. You have to see it to believe it. And there is Nicky Loud. So, on that 51 out of 72, Pironi leads. Pique, second. Rosberg, third. Louder, fourth. Daly, fifth. Alvareto, sixth. Tornbay, seventh. Giacomelli, eighth. And in ninth position, Mauro Baldi in the Pirelli shod arrows. And I draw attention to the tyres because they are making an enormous difference to the performance of the Tolmans and the Arrows cars in the first Grand Prix in which they have been used. Nicky Lauda here, fourth position. Not doing anything very much at the moment about uh, Rosberg. of course very well down the field he's been into the pits he's uh, a long way off world championship points and although he will go to the next Grand Prix the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch in the lead if Didier Pironi finishes where he is now as we look at Jean-Pierre Charrier and Nicky Lauda who is about to lap the Frenchman uh, although Watson will go into the British Grand Prix in the lead, it will be by a much reduced margin in comparison with what it is now. Ten points, and there's Daly. Derek Daly, number five, the Irishman from Dublin in the second of the two Williams cars, both of which, of course, are in the top World Championship scoring points six positions on lap 52. And Derek Daly is in fifth position. Daly, and now a very, very experienced Grand Prix racing driver, hasn't had uh, the best of luck since he joined the Williams team. He's only 16th equal in the World Championship with three points. And he's been challenged very hard indeed by Mauro Faldi, who is in his uh, third season of Grand Prix racing. But uh, he's, he's, Baldi is actually well down on the course because he, he's, uh, I think, a lap adrift in comparison with... Uh, no, I make a mistake and I apologise for it. It is Mark Sura who is behind uh, Derek Daly there. There's the Irishman. Behind him is the Swiss, Mark Sura. So now, lap 52. Pironi leads, Piquet second. Third is... Still, Kiki Rothman. Well, we got a little bit excited uh, about seven or eight laps ago when uh, the Ferrari of Peroni seemed to be slowing down and the gap closed up quite a bit by about five seconds with uh, PK. But in fact, uh, that I think must have been due to the traffic. Peroni, if you remember, was stuck in traffic at the time and he's now re established his gap at just over 30 seconds. So he's going pretty comfortably along the lead and obviously at the moment healthy and capable of handling any situation. here between these two. Derek Daly, who is in fifth position, is a car length ahead of Mark Sura, who tries to take it, but Sura is in tenth position and at least a lap adrift because he's been into the pits, I suspect, to take on new tyres, in which case he will be driving on fresh rubber, and which that'll give him a considerable advantage over Derek Daly, whose tyres will be uh, pretty worn at this stage of the race because in uh, lap 54 in a 72 lap race uh, we're well into it so on lap 54 it's still Ferrari driven by Pironi the V6 turbocharged seemingly now very reliable Ferrari of Didier Pironi and uh, he is well ahead of Nelson Piquet Sura challenging I remind you that Sura is in 10th position, Daly is in 5th, Sura is trying to unlap himself, there is the race leader, he is on lap 54, there 
is Ricardo Patrese, and there is Winklehock, chased by teammate Salazar, chased by Patrick Torbe, who's trying to lap the Chilean Salazar, and there was Baldi. Well, I'm afraid, sadly, the race has developed into a very spread out procession up front. We've got no real races going on through the field. So just a, a little word, some, some of you viewers might be interested to know just how hard it is to drive these cars. And uh, I think uh, first, the first preconception that must be removed is that they bear no relation whatsoever to driving a car on the road because you are subjected to huge G-forces, uh, the sort of G-forces that a lot of people have never experienced in any form of transport or situation in their lives. They pull about 3G in the corners and uh, even more under braking. Uh, the braking is probably the most staggering feature. And of course they accelerate in a pretty lively fashion as well. But uh, the G-forces cause great exhaustion with the drivers because whilst you're sub subjected to 3G, although you're held uh, with a lot of your body in the seat, your arms and legs still have to operate the controls. So if you imagine sitting for two, two hours with your arms straight out in front of you, and then multiply that pain by three, uh, or at times by that, then that's what your arms are having to fight. You use a lot of muscle just simply to operate uh, the parts of your body that need to operate to operate the car. So there's a great deal of physical effort required. The steering is very heavy anyway in these cars. The more grip they have, the heavier the steering gets. Hands get blistered through three layers of gloves. And of course the heat in the cockpit is quite staggering. You get a lot of heat there, and of course the drivers are wearing uh, fireproof clothing and material which is several layers thick and it's thermal stuff so it's like uh, wearing something that's uh, warmer than you'd need to be skiing in midwinter on a particularly cold area you'd be quite warm enough in your driving suit for that and of course they're operating mostly in summer conditions where things are very hot Cop cockpit temperatures of 150 degrees fahrenheit are not uncommon the result of which drivers lose the combination of the physical effort and the heat lose a great deal of weight during the race and a lot of them come close to or even get into uh, dehydration areas where the head starts to swim a little bit. Uh, I myself used to average a weight loss of something like nine pounds during a Grand Prix. And uh, for those of you ladies who are now rushing to your crash helmets and overalls to jump in a Grand Prix car and drive, I'm afraid it doesn't stay with you that weight loss because it's pure liquid and uh, you just put it back over the next 24 hours and uh, you don't uh, get rid of any other liquid. So your body just grabs everything and you don't actually lose any weight, you just dehydrate and then rehydrate through your normal eating and drinking in the next few hours, well, the next 24 hours. But the recovery period, even for these very fit drivers, is quite considerable. I used to really not, after a Sunday Grand Prix when most races are held, I certainly uh, would feel very groggy all day on Monday. Mind you, there's some debate as to whether that was to do with my hangover or the Grand Prix, because I always like to have some sort of a celebration or commiseration with myself after a race and have a bit of bit of a party, but uh, I certainly never used to feel okay till Tuesday morning. I'd be too tired to sleep well on the Monday night, suffering from that much exhaustion, and I'd get a good night's sleep on Monday, and then I'd feel all right on Tuesday morning. But I was pretty fit, and uh, so you can see that it really is um, an, a strain that to a lot of people who drive an all-car on the road, they find quite incomprehensible how heavy the physical thing. It's nothing to do with the pressure or the nervousness, it's just straight-faced overheating and exhaustion. Well, there you are, now you know, and this is lap 57, and here is Didier Pironi, who is some 26 seconds ahead of Nelson Piquet, who is in second position. Piquet is some 11 seconds ahead of Keke Rosberg, who is third. Rosberg is some 23 seconds ahead of Nicky Lauda, who is in fourth position. And then behind Nicky Lauda, who is fourth, there is Derek Daly in fifth position and Michele Alboreto. And we look at now Didier Pironi closing up on Daly. Daly, who is fifth. Pironi, the race leader, is about to lap, or will fairly soon lap Derek Daly. And then we'll have lapped everybody except Nicky Lauda and Keke Rosberg. A pretty devastating demonstration of Ferrari and Pironi combined superiority. And Pironi is on lap 58. Daly, therefore, is on the same lap, 
albeit nearly now two and a half miles behind Pironi, who will shortly be lapping him. The race leader, 28, car 28, Didier Pironi, 30 years old, lives in Geneva, 69th Grand Prix, won two of them, has driven for Tyrrell, drove for Ligier in 1980, as it was then called, before it became the Talbot team. He won the Belgian Grand Prix, he led at Monaco in Spain, he joined Ferrari in very controversial circumstances last year, having kept it secret to himself. He led in San Marino and Belgium last year, and then this year he finished sixth in Belgium, he won in San Marino, second in Monaco, third in Detroit, ninth in Canada, no points, but he's second in the World Championship, just ten points behind the championship leader John Watson, who is out of the running. And Daly trying very hard indeed. He sees, no doubt, Pironi in his mirrors. And uh, I'm wondering if Daly thinks that it might be Patrick Tornbay catching him again. Daly, of course, having got ahead of Patrick Tornbay, who is in seventh position. So the Ferraris are first and seventh. And Patrick Tornbay need feel no shame at being in seventh position he's come back into Grand Prix racing after having been out of it for quite a long time and uh, to be as well up as he has been in this race and still to be in seventh position is a considerable achievement Pironi and Daly Daly number five Pironi number 28 on lap 59 and the Ferrari now coming out at 150 miles an hour and now he's going to take Daly. You'll see the turbo pull out of the slipstream of the Williams, and he just drives straight past. Now, that will demonstrate to you what James and I were talking about when we talk about the A and the B races, because you can see the colossal power differential between the Ferrari, which must be these days producing about 580 reliable brake horsepower, and the Ford V8 engine, the extremely fine Ford V8 engine which has won 148 Grand Prix and but which produces about 500 horsepower so Pironi's got an extra 80 horsepower or so under his foot in comparison with Derek Daly and you can see the difference that it makes lap 60 now Pironi leads number 28 second PK third Rosberg in uh, fourth position behind Kiki Rosberg, Nicky Lauda, then fifth Derek Daly who has been lapped, and I think I overlooked Lauda when I was talking earlier on about uh, where Pironi had lapped up to, he has lapped up to Nicky Lauda of course who is fourth, and has lapped Derek Daly who is fifth. Another lap completed down into the long, long straight over the west tunnel again goes the Ferrari and Didier Pironi the very chubby Frenchman who harking back to what James was saying loses an enormous amount of weight every time he gets in the car when he when he when Pironi gets out of the car he really does look as though he's been in a sauna inside his overalls sweat is pouring out of him and uh, now he's closing up on uh, Nicky Lauda, but we look at Ricardo Patrese, we look at uh, Patrick Tombe there, and, and there is Nelson Piquet. The last of these cars that we're looking at is Nelson Piquet, who is in second place, coming up the lap, Patrick Tombe, who has been passed by Mark Sura. So Sura in the uh, Baldi, Baldi, I'm sorry, there, number 30, is Mauro Baldi. He's in seventh position now. And a restatement of the positions would help. Lap 61, Pironi leads, PK second, Rosberg third, Lauda fourth, Daly, who has been lapped, is fifth, Alboreto is sixth, Baldi is seventh, and Patrick Torbe, number 27 in the background there, is down to eighth position. And he has been lapped, of course, by Nelson Piquet which is the th in the third of these two, four cars that we're looking at at the moment. A 
And I say again, for those of you who saw but didn't uh, hear the result of that horrific-looking crash that René Arnoux was involved in, that we had the news from the Renault pit that René Arnoux, having another terrible hard luck race, has at least had the good luck to be uninjured or no bones broken in that dreadful-looking crash. Ricardo Patrese, having been passed by Piquet, must be having some kind of trouble. He's about to be uh, passed too by Patrick Tombe, who is in eighth position. Here's the second place man, Piquet. And we are on lap 62 out of 72. So Pironi's uh, problem is more to keep going and to maintain the gap between himself and Piquet than to extend it because he has got a very comfortable cushion. In fact, Pironi has actually gone through to start his 63rd lap as Piquet comes down towards the boss suite and Rosberg now is right up with uh, Tombe there. They're getting very spread out over the course. Here is Piquet coming down now. And the gap between Piquet, who is in second place, and Pironi, the race leader, is now 31 seconds. So, if anything, Pironi is extending his lead. And very close together are Rosberg and Piquet. Rosberg is starting to close up. There's Patrese, there's Patrese, and he's uh, battling with Rosberg, who dives through, or does he, at the Rob Slotomacher curve? Yes. Well, Rosberg seems to be closing the gap between himself and Nelson Piquet. He's got ahead of Patrese, who is in an identical car as the second place man, Nelson Piquet, as far as chassis and engine are concerned, but it's going much slower than uh, Piquet's car. And Kenny Rosberg there, driving a typically gritty race, holds his third position. Can he do anything about Nelson Piquet, who is second? driver Jochen Maas who's got one Grand Prix victory behind him the Spanish Grand Prix in 1975 and Patrick Tombe now is setting about Ricardo Patrese. Tombe is in eighth position and uh, Ricardo Patrese of course well behind him having been into the pits well behind him as far as race distance is concerned albeit in front of him on the course and on lap 64 out of 72 then it is uh, Tombe's teammate Pironi leading in the Ferrari from PK second, Rosberg third, Nicky Lauda fourth. There's been no change there for a long, long time. And Derek Daly is still in fifth position ahead of Alvareto, who is sixth. Mark Schurer, who is seventh, down to eighth place has gone Tombe. Ninth is Giacomelli. Naja, the verletzbarkeit der Turbos is ja noch nicht ganz ausgemerkt. Die Turboautos sind schwerer, brauchen dementsprechend mehr Reifengummi oder sie verwenden überhaupt härtere Reifen. Sie brauchen mehr Benzin. Dadurch erhöht sich das Wagengewicht notgedrungen noch etwas. Der Vorsprung von Pironi. And there's Rosberg. Rosberg gesticulating to Sura, I suspect to thank him for letting him pass and Torbe now is going to take the opportunity to get past Ricardo Patrese on braking at Tarzan and pulls away having completed 64 laps in comparison with the race leaders 60 sorry 63 laps in comparison with the race leaders 64 the race leader being his teammate Didier Pironi 
And Pironi now is 34 seconds ahead of Piquet, who is only four seconds ahead of Rosberg. So Kiki Rosberg is really charging. There's Tombe, who is eighth. And the positions now are Pironi leads, Piquet second, Rosberg third, Lauda fourth, Daly fifth, Alvareto sixth, Balvi seventh, Tombe eighth, Giacomelli ninth, Sura tenth, Winkelhock in the ATS 11, Salazar in the second ATS 12, then Jochen Maus, who we've just seen come into the pits, John Watson in 14th place, two laps adrift, right out of World Championship contention. So what I keep saying is demonstrated again. This man, number 28, Didier Pironi, is going to be one point behind the World Championship leader, John Watson, at the end of this race, if they both maintain their current positions. An enormously exciting prospect for the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. We will be moving from a picture point of view soon, I hope, from Didier Pironi to the tremendously exciting battle which is developing between Nelson Piquet and the third position man, Keke Rosberg, who is now only three and a half seconds behind Piquet. Yes, late charge by Rosberg. Piquet is quite likely to have more worn tyres than Rosberg. These turbocharged cars have to carry more fuel. They're heavier. They've got more power. So they put a, quite a lot more load through the tyres than the lighter, nimbler, three-litre, normally aspirated engine cars. And uh, Rosberg is catching quite fast. He's going to come right up to Piquet, but the problem is he's only three seconds behind now, but he's got uh, the big problems, as usual, to pass him when he gets there. Uh, because whilst the Brabham appears to be slowing down a little on handling, it doesn't appear to be in any way unhealthy. The engine sounds fine uh, in the engine department, and uh, he will... It, already proved today to be the fastest of even the turbo cars so Rosberg's got a real battle on his hands in the closing stages of the Dutch Grand Prix lap 67 Didier Pironi has a seemingly commanding lead of 34 seconds over this man number one Nelson Piquet the world champion who is second in his Brabham BMW but in the background Kiki Rosberg is gaining, gaining, gaining on the sliding Brabham of Nelson Piquet. The gap is now down to three seconds between number one, Nelson Piquet, and number six, Kiki Rosberg. Battling for second and third places. There is Rosberg. It looks less than three seconds to me now. They will soon be going through to complete their 68th lap in this 72-lap race. And Kiki Rosberg looks as though he could take second place. Well, despite the exhaustion, uh, the sight of Piquet's car getting bigger and bigger ahead of him as he gets closer will have given Rosberg that little adrenaline charge to really lift himself up, and he's back charging again. I must say, Rosberg has uh, really found his niche in the Williams team now that he's uh, got, finally got a good car to, to um, use his talents on, which were in, never in question. He's showing great determination. He's a real fighter. He's a very tough sort of guy, stockily built, and... Uh, Looks pretty tough physically, very much in the Alan Jones mold. Not quite as big a chap as Alan Jones, but uh, and showing all that uh, grit and uh, determination on the track and the willingness to throw the car around. So he's chasing, and if anybody in the field in a normally aspirated car can has can find a way around TK, Rosberg is the man. Well, we've talked a lot about the turbo one and a half litre cars and the mainly Ford three litre engine cars in this race, but. The fact is that on lap 68, there are only two turbos left in the top six, which are the World Championship scoring positions, and they are the first and second cars, the Ferrari of Pironi and the Brabham BMW of Piquet. And there is Ketty Rosberg in third position, and I'll be able to give you the gap this time as they come out of the corner which leads into the long straight and Nelson Piquet goes past me now and Rosberg goes past me now and the gap is 3.42 seconds so Piquet has actually slightly extended his lead yes Piquet has responded there they both are you just got to 
glimpse of Rosberg in the background, but uh, it appears that TK has been pacing himself towards the finish because he seemed able to respond to Rosberg's charge and uh, hold the gap. And of course, he still has uh, that huge power advantage should Rosberg get up behind him. So at the moment, it looks like TK uh, playing cat and mouse a little bit and fairly secure in second place. But uh, thank goodness we've been given something to cheer about at the end of this race because really the second half has been uh, quite abysmally processional, which is a great shame, but it happens from time to time. We've had some pretty good racing, and we had a very, very good opening two laps of this race with lots of excitement. Lap 69, three laps to go at the end of this one. Pironi is out on his own, and there he is going into Tarzan, having completed his 69th lap. But what a battle going on behind him with just three laps to go between Piquet and uh, Rosberg with Rosberg now three seconds behind Piquet. Piquet has completed his 69th lap. Rosberg goes past me now. The gap is now 3.9 seconds. So Piquet, as James said, has got the message from his pit signals, is responding to them, is extending the lead that he has in second place over third place man, Ketty Rosberg. There is the race leader on his 70th out of 72 laps. In fourth position, it is Nicky Lauda, who is now some 45 seconds in fourth place behind Rosberg. In fifth position, it is Derek Daly, who is a lap adrift behind Pironi. Sixth is Alvareto, seventh is Baldi, eighth is Torbay, ninth is Sura, tenth is Giacomelli, eleventh is Finkelhock, twelfth is Salazar, thirteenth, the world championship leader, John Watson, well out of the points. 14th, Jarier, and 15th, Ricardo Patrese, the teammate of Nelson Piquet here. Well, it's not a question of who's going to win, provided P uh, Peroni keeps going. It is rather a question of who is going to be second. And here comes P Piquet. There's Rosberg in the background. I don't see how Rosberg can possibly catch the Brazilian. And there is Alvareto off, and the gap is now 4.2 seconds as PK comes up to Alvareto now. Is Alvareto going to balk him and give uh, Rosberg a chance? No. Yes, he's still not got past. And see how his right rear tyre is smoking. Yes, Alvareto's got a puncture or something on that tyre. He spun. He was trying to make an overtaking manoeuvre at the end of the straight. He spun a bit, but uh, PK has managed to get through. Very frustrating for him. And I would think Alberto, if he knows there's something wrong, would be well advised to stop. Because it looks as if that tower might be ready to fall apart in a minute or something. And so Alberto, what could be, or could it be oil leaking under the car, onto the exhaust, and then possibly onto the tower? And you can see that Rosberg has really grasped his opportunity there. This is lap 71 out of 72. Here is the race leader, Didier Pironi, going through to start his last lap. He is on his last lap. Now, what about uh, Piquet in second place and Rosberg? The fact that Rosberg got past Alvareto and that Alvareto held Piquet up for so long has enabled the Finnish driver in the Williams, Kenny Rosberg, to close right up on the second place man, Nelson Piquet. And the gap now is 1.2 seconds. It is on the last lap we are concentrating from a picture point of view on Didier Pironi and it looks as though it is going to be the worst possible result from the point of view of the world championship leader John Watson who is in 12th place right out of the world championship points position he was 10 points ahead of this man number 28 who is on his way to win the Dutch Grand Prix Didier Pironi Pironi will get nine points for his victory, and that means to say that he will be just one point behind the world championship leader, John Watson, who will still be in that position for the next Grand Prix, the British Grand Prix of Franz Hatcher. What a wonderful prospect that is. Didier Pironi then, almost home. He's got to win now. He could kick out the clutch and coast home to victory. There are the Ferrari mechanics. 
Didier Veroni has won his second Grand Prix of 1982, having won at San Marino, and he's now in the second place in the World Championship, one point behind John Watson, but what about second place? Are we going to see the battle between Nelson Piquet? Yes, there it is. You can see Nelson Piquet. He finishes in second place, and he finishes, according to my stopwatch, seven tenths of a second ahead of a brilliantly hard-charging Keki Frostberg, who is therefore in third position. So, the Dutch Grand Prix ends with the second win for Didier Pironi this year with Nelson Piquet in second place, Kiki Rosberg third, Nicky Lauda fourth, Derek Daly fifth and lapped, and Mauro Baldi on the last lap took sixth position away from Michele Alboreto. And that, of course, makes a big difference to the World Championship situation because now John Watson is only one point ahead of Didier Pironi, who is eight points ahead of Keki Rosberg, who is two points ahead of the fourth place man Ricardo, but then one point to the fifth place man Alain Prost, and another one to the sixth place man Nelson Piquet, which means to say that the battle for world championship points at the British Grand Prix of Brands Hatch in two weeks' time is going to be all the more exciting. Und da durchs Ziel gekommen, Lauda damit Vierter geworden, drei Punkte für den Österreicher im heutigen Grand Prix von Holland und das ist die Auslaufrunde des Siegers von heute, Didier Pironi. Der dritte Grand Prix Sieg in der Karriere des Franzosen, dessen Großvater ja aus Italien stammt, daher auch dieser italienisch klingende Name. Derek Deli ist mit einer Runde Rückstand Fünfter geworden, Mauro Baldi Sechster ist damit der 23. Fahrer, der in der Weltmeisterschaft 1982 Punkte für die Weltmeisterschaft gewonnen hat, hat vom Dreher Michele Alvaretto zwei Runden Verschluss, also doch noch profitiert. Baldi Sechster, Alvaretto Siebenter, Taupe Achter, Zura Neunter. Damit ist Zura der einzige Fahrer, der die letzten fünf Grand Prix Rennen ausnahmslos beendet hat. Die letzten fünf deshalb, weil Zura ja erst vor fünf Rennen ein Comeback wieder gefeiert hat. Und zwar nach seinem schweren Testunfall in Kielami. Zura Neunter mit einer Runde Rückstand, dann haben wir mit zwei Runden Rückstand 10. Giacomelli, 11. Winkelhock, 12. Watson, 13. Salazar und mit drei Runden Rückstand 14. Charrier und 15. Patrese. John Watson kommt als Weltmeisterschaftsführender zum großen Preis von England nach Brent Hedge. Niki Lauda ist auf den siebenten Platz zurückgefallen, wurde heute von äh, Nelson Piquet also überholt, Watson, Pironi, Rosberg, Patrese, Prost, Piquet und Lauda. 15 Punkte trennen die ersten sieben. Hier haben Sie noch einmal Sandford aus der Hubschrauberperspektive. Didier Pironi, ein äh, auf stille Art glücklicher Sieger. Er ist nie ein Rennfahrer gewesen, der Freudenausbrüche gezeigt hat, wenn er gewonnen hat. Naja, und damit hat Didier Pironi die Liste jener Fahrer, zur Liste jener Fahrer ausgeschlossen, die drei Grand Prix Siege haben. Die Engländer Mike Hosern und Peter Collins, der Amerikaner Phil Hill, interessanterweise ausnahmslos Ferrari-Fahrer. Und hier haben sie noch einmal die Sieger von heute, den 30-jährigen Franzosen, die die Pironi auf Ferrari. Er ist nach dem Unglück Schilbildöff Ferraris einzige Hoffnung, heuer noch den Weltmeistertitel zu gewinnen. Und er ist drauf und dran, diese Hoffnung möglicherweise auch zu erfüllen. Ein sehr interessantes Gespräch ist Jean-Marie Balestre und Didier Pironi. Sie wissen, Pironi ist ja auch der Präsident der neu gegründeten profi rennfahrer -Vereinigung. Balestre ist kürzlich von der ersten seiner vielen Funktionen innerhalb des Automobilsport-Weltverbandes zurückgetreten. Kurze Diskussion zwischen Pironi und Piquet. Oben warten wir noch auf den dritten, auf Keke Rosberg. Interview mit Didier Pironi hören konnten. Ich habe es leider nicht hören können, kann ihm also dadurch nicht sagen, was er zu seinem Erfolg gesagt hat. Kirche Rosberg hat den beiden Konkurrenten gratuliert. 
Pironi und Bicke. Links Rosberg in der Mitte, Pironi und rechts Bicke. Aber Sie kennen, glaube ich, die Grand Prix fahrer ohnehin schon längst seit unseren vielen Übertragungen. Erster Ferrari-Sieg in Holland seit Niki Lauda 1977. Zweiter Ferrari-Saison-Sieg 1982. Dritter Grand Prix-Sieg in der Karriere von Didier Pironi. Das ist der Lohn für äh, tausende Kilometer Testeinsatz. Es gibt wenige Rennfahrer, die so viel testen wie Didier Pironi, aber er nützt die Möglichkeiten auf der Ferrari-Teststrecke für Rano genauso aus, wie sie früher Niki Lauda ausgenutzt hat. Es gibt ja keinen anderen Rennstall, der solche Möglichkeiten hat, um äh, neue Autos abzustimmen, um Modifikationen an den Autos zu erproben, wie Ferrari in Fiorano eigenes äh, Fernsehsystem. Es gibt Computer, man kann das Fahrverhalten des Autos auf jeden Zentimeter der Strecke nicht nur filmen, sondern äh, natürlich auch speichern, stoppen, jederzeit auf Abruf äh, bereithalten. Es sind unglaubliche Dinge, die die Techniker von Ferrari in Fiorano lernen können. die Siegerehrung im Grand Prix von Holland. Noch einmal erster Didier Pironi Frankreich auf Ferrari, zweiter Nelson Piquet Brasilien auf Brev BMW Turbo, ein Doppelsieg also der Turbofahrzeuge, dritter Keke Rosberg Finnland auf Williams und an der vierten Stelle zum ersten Mal also seit Solder wieder in den Weltmeisterschaft Punkte rängen. Aber diese drei Punkte kann ihm heute keiner wegnehmen. Niki Lauda mit dem McLaren. Hier wird der verunglückte Renault Turbo von René Arnoux weggebracht. Nächster Grand Prix für Sie, meine Damen und Herren. Morgen in zwei Wochen in Brentage der klassische Grand Prix von England. Und mit diesen Bildern sage ich Ihnen auf Wiedersehen vom Grand Prix von Holland aus Sandford. Danke fürs Zuschauen und ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen recht... The Ferrari looks very good. I mean, uh, it's not only quick, it's reliable, which is a shame because we expect the turbos to break down more often. But Brands is a difficult circuit as well. And, uh, I, well, I hope it will favor our cars. Certainly at Brands it's a handling circuit. And I think that our cars generally are better handling than the Ferrari. But uh, the reliability and the power of the car certainly is very impressive now. John, what about Brands Hatch as far as Watson is concerned? Well, I like the circuit very much. Uh, I've always enjoyed racing on it, and it is my home Grand Prix, and if I can get the support from the public like I had last year at Silverstone, when they helped me win, I believe, uh, then maybe I can have another victory in the British Grand Prix. Well, naturally, we all hope so. Commiserations on today, and good luck for Brands. Thank you.